Um, why don't we get started? Good, good, good afternoon. It's good to have you here. Um, this is uh, an occasion that we look forward to every year, the Marx Lecture. I wanted to say a, a word about uh, the Marx Lecture before I have a few words about our distinguished visitor today, Professor Fish. Um, as, as some of you know, this lecture uh, bears the name of Robert S. Marx, who um, is one of the most distinguished graduates of the College of Law and one of Cincinnati's uh, prominent contributions uh, to society. He, he, that is to say, Robert Marx, was um, a veteran of World War I who actually uh, suffered wounds, uh, serious wounds, on the last day of the war, 1918, um, which earned him the Distinguished Service Cross, but also prompted him to found, uh, in 1920, the Disabled American Veterans which is an organization that you know still goes on today very strong and that it's an organization as well that proudly uh, recognizes um, his major contributions in bringing it about. He was a judge here in Cincinnati serving on the very same uh, bench that William Howard Taft served on before him and was the last judge to sit on what was called the Superior Court of Cincinnati. He was an influential uh, advisor to Franklin Roosevelt during, uh, during that president's uh, uh, administration and those of us who know the law school community um, uh, know Judge Marx in another significant way. Back when, when clinical education and practical legal education wasn't so formalized in the academy, he had created a course that uh, was really ahead of its time and recognized by legal scholars around the nation uh, as innovative. It was called FACTS and to this day I meet graduates from the 50s and early 60s who took this course that was really a precursor of applied legal studies and legal skills, excuse me, um, and um, we're grateful for the endowment with which uh, he has left us to promote this, uh, this lecture series. Um, it has, since 1953, allowed us to bring some of the very finest legal scholars and uh, legal thinkers to Cincinnati to uh, share uh, stimulation and inspiration with us, and there's no exception today. We have with us um, a scholar who is truly one of the leading lights in law and business in the legal academy in the United States. Uh, Jill Fish is a graduate of Cornell University and Yale Law School, and she is currently the Perry Golkin Professor of Law at the University of Pennsylvania, where she has taught since 2008 in the areas, as you've guessed it, corporate law and corporate governance, securities regulation, as well as federal courts. Before she uh, went to Penn Law, she taught for 10 years at Fordham, where she also held a distinguished professorship, and she was the founding director of Fordham's Corporate Law Center. She's also served as a visiting professor at Harvard, at Columbia, and at Georgetown. Her career's been a really bright one of illuminating work in the corporate field, frequently focusing with particularity on the role of the courts in the regulation of our capital markets. She's the author of more than 50 scholarly works uh, in the area, and those, those have appeared, as you might expect, in the most prominent law journals in the country, including Harvard and Yale and Penn's, of course, and Chicago. I could go on and on. She's a leader in the field, a member of the American Law Institute, a director of the European Corporate Governance Institute, and a former chair of the board of directors of the American Law and Economics Association, as well as having served in leadership roles in the various sections of the Association of American Law Schools um, that pertain to her field. Now, this room may or may not strike her as uh, sufficiently uh, familiar, but she was in here 15 years ago, uh, speaking to our corporate law symposium here, delivering a paper on the role of the Delaware courts uh, and their influential role in, in, in ensuring that that district remained competitive with others in the securing of corporate charters. Um, it's great to have her back here today to reflect on different issues, in this case, uh, contemporary efforts since the financial crisis of 2008 uh, to empower the shareholders of public companies. Are those efforts going to curb the kind of risky corporate behavior that makes us vulnerable to financial crises? Or might they make risky behavior even more likely? Why don't we find out? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in warmly welcoming again to Cincinnati Professor Jill Fish. Thank you for that fantastic introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, the room looks vaguely familiar from 15 years ago. Um, 
Uh, I do remember that I had a fantastic time at the uh, symposium, and the article that I published uh, in that symposium issue has gotten a lot of attention, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, you guys did a great job. Um, I'm here today to talk about, as the title says, risk, incentives, and shareholder empowerment in uh, J.P. Morgan and more generally in the public corporation. I can't promise you a solution to the financial crisis or even an explanation for the financial crisis. My goals today are much more modest to uh, hopefully cause you to reflect, to think a little bit more carefully about some of the legal and regulatory developments in this area and to consider the relationship between law and business in dealing with these policy questions. So I'm gonna put some issues on the table and I'm gonna try and stop in time so that we can have some Q&A or discussion. Um, if I uh, seem like I'm just bulldozing along too long, feel free to rustle your lunch and act restless and I'll, 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 I'll move along so we have the time to do that. Um, so this is, uh, let me, I, I guess I should stand sort of to the side here, but let me just give you an overview of uh, the paper or what I'm hoping to talk about. Um, obviously, my sort of case study is the London Whale and some of the other areas in which J.P. Morgan has gotten into trouble uh, publicly over the last several years. Um, and uh, the way these public uh, problems relate to the more general issue of risk taking in the public corporation. I'm then going to talk about one of the ways that policymakers have responded to this problem, and that is shareholder empowerment. Uh, I focus in my discussion of shareholder empowerment on one specific example, that's executive compensation and say on pay. Um, and I end by considering the shareholder approach to an alternative, an alternative that's specific to financial institutions, and that is the Volcker Rule. Right? So that's my roadmap, that's my overview, so you can kind of keep track of where we are in the talk. A couple of caveats before I get started. Uh, first of all, this focuses on J.P. Morgan and the London Whale as an example, um, but I don't claim that anything that I'm gonna say about J.P. Morgan is exceptional. Right? This is not a story of what went wrong specifically at J.P. Morgan. I'm not pretending that J.P. Morgan is the cause of the financial crisis. In fact, J.P. Morgan did relatively well uh, when in other financial institutions were struggling during the financial crisis. Right? So this is an example. It's a focal point. Uh, it's a way to sort of tell the story. Uh, nor am I in this paper, even though I'm focusing on executive compensation, I'm not even at the tip of the iceberg in terms of defining is there a problem with executive compensation or how should we best address that problem. And when I start talking about executive compensation, I'm going to talk about a host of issues that people have raised, right? This is not a paper about how to fix executive compensation, either in corporate America generally or at financial institutions, right? Rather, right, I'm focusing on the sort of good governance approach as a way of increasing management accountability and whether uh, the whale and J.P. Morgan's problems can be adequately characterized as a governance failure to which shareholder empowerment may or may not be an appropriate response. So that's setting the stage. Very modest task that way. You set the bar low enough, right? Um, okay, so that's the financial crisis. Um, you know, we always have to have a picture. Um, <laughs> and of course, uh, I think we know by now uh, J.P. Morgan was not a big part of the so-called problem, right? To the extent that financial institutions had a role in the financial crisis, and I think we can all agree that they did, J.P. Morgan had a relatively conservative investment strategy during the financial crisis, was in fairly good shape, both 
uh, during and immediately after, actually posted a profit at the time that many of these big banks were suffering substantial losses. And this gave Jamie Dimon, the CEO of Morgan, particular credibility in the congressional hearings that sort of uh, uh, struggled with the question, what to do, how should things be fixed? Uh, particular credibility, because he seemed to be somebody who had managed the bank in a way so as to weather the cr crisis fairly well. And Jamie Dimon also, for a period of time, up till immediately before the whale, was one of the biggest critics of some of the reforms in Dodd-Frank, saying that these reforms were unnecessary, that they weren't appropriately tailored to the problems that Congress had identified, and that they would make things operationally impossible for financial institutions going forward, right? He, you know, he said things like, you know, if you're going to uh, trade in light of these reforms, you have to have a lawyer sitting on one side of you and a psychiatrist on the other. And you know, I, I, that for me, that mental image sort of conjures up the angel and the devil sitting on your shoulder. And I'm just not sure whether the lawyer or the psychiatrist is the devil. Um, in any event, so J.P. Morgan's not the problem. He's testifying. He's getting a lot of people to kind of go along with his views. And then the whale arrives, right? And um, Jamie Dimon's first public reaction to the whale, and I'll talk about the whale in a minute, right, is this quote that we've seen all over the newspaper. It was a tempest in a teapot, Jamie Dimon said. Famous last words, so to speak. Um, what was the whale? Um, summing it down, so boiling it down, mixing my metaphors, uh, boiling it down, um, and there's uh, a lot more detail about this in uh, my article. Um, Jamie J.P. Morgan traders, traders specifically in the chief investment office, a small London office, made a lot of large and risky derivatives trades. Started off small, the uh, size, the volume of trading increased over time, uh, increased over time in part because of the financial crisis. One of the things that we saw in the financial crisis was a flight to safety. Investors took their money out of investments that they viewed as risky and put that money into banks. So J.P. Morgan's uh, uh, chief investment office was managing what are called excess deposits, and the volume of these ex excess deposits mushroomed. Um, the trading that Morgan did in these uh, derivatives was initially very profitable. The office was reporting big, uh, successful numbers, everybody was very happy with what they were doing, um, but the strategy, the market turned against the investments. As the size of the derivatives bets increased, uh, they started to lose money, and people perhaps panicked. Uh, they didn't want to report losses after being the darlings of the firm, and so they doubled down on many of their bets. They increased the risk of many of their positions, and at some point, they started to fudge on the actual numbers, to report um, uh, profits that weren't there, to change their valuation methods so that it looked like a trade was profitable when in fact it wasn't. It was a way of covering up billions of dollars as it turned out in losses. And when they were finally caught, the traders, including Jamie Dimon with his famous Tempest in a Teapot quote, tried to minimize the problem. It really wasn't that big deal. So we made a few bets that didn't pay off, we lost some money, no real harm. So, of course, as we know with the benefit of hindsight, um, the public, Congress, regulators viewed the whale as a big deal. But what kind of big deal? Was it a governance problem? Was it a shareholder problem? Was it a broader public problem? With respect to governance, a couple of things to keep in mind. First of all, that chief investment office, um, what was it supposed to be doing? I said it was placing large, risky derivatives bets. That's not what the documentation said. That's not what the supposed mission of the office was. The chief investment office was supposed to be a hedging center. 
They were supposed to be making trades that offset, that reduced Morgan's overall level of risk. In fact, the trades dramatically increased Morgan's level of risk. Now keep in mind, this is stuff that's happening after the financial crisis, after all of these big banks got burned for engaging in risky trading behavior. You've got this office out there that's supposed to be uh, minimizing bank risk, and they're increasing the risk. And what Congress said is, this is the hedge that wasn't. I think I read a children's book, The Witch That Wasn't. Uh, <laughs> um, why were they doing this? Well, the office was staffed, and I will show you the staffing uh, a little bit later, was staffed by very highly compensated employees who were incentivized to take risks. These were not people who were paid as risk managers. These were people who were paid as investment bankers, as traders, and their pay was based on the profitability of the chief investment office and the profitability of Morgan overall. If that's what your pay structure looks like, you're gonna take risk. There was nothing, Congress went through the overall incentive structure, there was nothing in the compensation structure that rewarded any of those executives for minimizing the bank's level of risk. Nothing that even looked at the overall effect, the hedging effect of their trading behavior. Right? So possible governance problem, possible warning sign. Poor risk management. J.P. Morgan, as I said, came out of the financial crisis smelling like a rose, had what was touted to be best-in-class risk management practices at a time when everyone was focused on risk management. What happened? The whale trades sent up red flags, violated J.P. Morgan's risk management policies something like 330 times, according to Congress. 330 times, but nobody in the bank responded. Jamie Dimon, the board, high-level executives outside the CIO, nobody looked into the trades and said, gee, something is inconsistent, something has set off a warning bell, we need to figure out what's going on. High, lack of high-level supervision, okay, I think I just covered that. And finally, the trades led to, right, the initial trades are just losses, trading losses, but the trades led to a much bigger problem, misleading filings, regulatory filings with bank regulators, misleading securities filings, outright fraud with respect to the bank's financial condition. So, okay, some reasons to think that maybe this was a corporate governance problem. Was it a public problem? Well, as I said, um, the bank triggered a fairly dramatic public response. Every time a big corporation loses money, that's not necessarily a public problem. Big corporations lose money, they make bad business decisions, banks make bad trading decisions, happens all the time. This particular bad business decision spurred two separate congressional hearings, a uh, 300-page report, testimony by uh, all five different uh, uh, Morgan employees. Uh, J.P. Morgan paid over a billion dollars in fines just out of the whale incident. And the uh, OCC consent order, which the bank signed, said that the derivatives trading constituted recklessly unsafe and unsound practices. Unsafe and unsound, not just with respect to the bank, but with respect to the public interest. One thing to keep in mind in looking at this uh, sort of effect is how it plays into this idea of big corporations as public. And this publicness question has been a, uh, a recent concern, a recent focal point in a lot of corporate law, corporate governance scholarship, right? So let me talk a little bit more about publicness at J.P. Morgan, because the whale wasn't an isolated incident, right? Over the next several years and continuing on to the present day, 
you might feel like, gee, I have to update my slides every 30 minutes because there's something else in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, JP Morgan, uh, news reports have revealed that JP Morgan has gotten into trouble in other areas. They've had other problems, right? What are some of these problems? Um, well, there was the fact that years before the Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme was un uncovered, uh, executives at JP Morgan realized that something was going on, uh, didn't report it, sort of helped uh, cover it up so long as Morgan could get their money out and uh, emerge uh, without any losses. Um, uh, uh, false statements in the mortgage-backed securities market, uh, energy manipulation, manipulation in the uh, Western electricity market, uh, foreign, foreign exchange manipulation, uh, allegations that I think the investigation is still pending on with respect to uh, bribing foreign officials. The list goes on, right? And the list has had a price, but it also has had public attention, public, arguably, accountability. Right? So Morgan has paid, they paid a billion dollars to settle the whale. They've paid billions more in settling all of these other instances of misconduct. And the government investigations, the consent decrees, the fines are a reflection of the fact that these weren't just operating mistakes. These were misdeeds that had a widespread public impact on consumers, on credit card holders, on investors, on people who use electricity, right? The, the, the list of public affected parties goes on and on. Okay, so what does it mean, this idea of corporate publicness? I said there's a recent literature on this issue. The literature is not recognition of a new phenomenon. We know that big corporations have a public impact. We've known that for years. The first big corporations, right, the railroads, were regulated and feared because of their impact on the public. Among other things, the railroads used to like go by people's farms and set the fields on fire, right? That's sort of negative externality, public effect. Um, the general problem is that big corporations, number one, can make big decisions, have uh, decisions that have widespread impact, and there's a concern that they will externalize risk, ex externalize harm on members of the public more generally. The federal securities laws were adopted not just to protect the capital markets and to protect investors, but because of the spillover effect, the concern that corporate misconduct could have a broader effect on the general economy. We see that same concern reflected in Dodd-Frank, response to the financial crisis, right? It's not just a matter of investor protection, right? People are losing jobs. Um, there's a spillover effect from businesses that are engaged in misconduct to properly managed, properly run businesses, right? That's all corporate publicness, right? So, Publicness continues to drive regulatory reform. Publicness also is what's driving this demand for accountability. When you talk to people about the financial crisis, many people express disappointment that we don't see executives going to jail, that we don't see criminal prosecutions, that we don't see some sort of clearer accountability for what people perceive as widespread harm, right? Those kinds of responses, criminal prosecution, are public responses. They are a uh, perception that the corporate mistakes were not a private matter between the corporation and its shareholders, right? That it's not enough that the shareholders lost money, somebody should be held uh, more accountable, right? So you might say, if the problem is publicness, why then look to shareholders for a solution? It seems a little bit counterintuitive. But as far back as Sarbanes-Oxley and before, in response to the governance uh, uh, scandals of the late 1990s, 
We've also seen this move, and Lucian Bebchuk is one of the big champions, to increase shareholder empowerment as a way of increasing managerial accountability. If there's a problem, if managers are making bad decisions, if they're engaged in fraud, if they're taking too much risk, the answer is to increase shareholder oversight. Okay. Oddly enough, the um, uh, um, Richard Breeden, who was uh, the uh, caretaker for WorldCom in response to the governance scandals at that time, had this long list of shareholder empowerment, empowerment solutions that he put into place to address or to fix the WorldCom problem. Uh, Sarbanes-Oxley increases shareholder empowerment. Uh, Dodd-Frank goes even further, as I'll talk about. Right? So shareholder empowerment is obviously one aspect of a broader good governance approach. Is improving corporate governance a solution? Right? And so here are some examples, both of the public impact, the uh, consequences of corporate publicness, and some possible uh, good governance or governance re reforms that might address those problems. Right? I want to focus on the example of executive compensation. I could spend all day talking about these different problems. I could spend the next half hour talking about separating the chair and CEO positions. That would be fun, too. It's not what I've prepared to talk about. But it's, it's a fun question. It's a fun issue. But I want to focus on executive compensation. It's gotten a lot of attention. And it's gotten sp it, specific legislation designed to harness the shareholder role, to say, OK, if we've got a problem with executive compensation, let's make shareholders part of the solution. I also think executive compensation is a good example because there's a nice tie between the compensation structure of the CIO executives and the risk taking that led to the whale. Right? So I'm going to connect the dots using executive compensation. OK. Putting on the table, there are lots of issues with executive compensation. We've been debating certainly as long as I've been in law about executive compensation. Is it problematic? Does it have to be fixed? OK? Um, I'm not going to talk about all of these different things. Maybe executives are paid too much. Maybe there's this pay disparity between the uh, CEO and the average worker. Uh, maybe it's too short term. Uh, I'm going to focus on incentives for excessive risk taking. All right? So here are the members of the CIO team. Right? The uh, Ina Drew has gotten probably the most publicity, aside from the whale himself, Bruno Ixel. But these are the people who were basically part of the whale in the London office. Right? These five people were paid a total of $105 million between 2010 and 2011, the time period when the London office was getting more and more money, engaging in riskier, higher volume trades, and eventually, eventually cooking the books. They were among the most highly paid employees at JP Morgan. Now, JP Morgan's a big investment bank. They do lots of fancy things. Remember, I said this office was supposed to be sort of a compliance office concerned about hedging, but these are some of the highest paid uh, employees. Uh, the congressional report said they're paid at the level of investment bankers, and specifically, they had incentive structures. Their pay had in the incentive structures of investment bankers, not risk managers. Right? High levels of pay that motivated these employees to take risks. Right? That's one year's pay for each of those executives. You might notice right, at least two or three people who are getting more in a year than the average big public company CEO in the United States. Right? So, and these are not Jamie Dimon. So I think the congressional report is pretty convincing in its analysis 
that the overall pay structure at the chief investment office was broken. I think they're right about that. But the question that I have is whether shareholder empowerment is a sensible solution. Can we fix the deficiencies? And I've been a little superficial, but can we fix the deficiencies in this pay structure through so-called good governance? Okay. What Congress introduced in 2010 was a shareholder vote on executive compensation, say on pay. Say on pay is a non-binding shareholder vote. The shareholders are given the pay package of the top executives, and they vote up or down, approve or disapprove the pay package. The uh, company, the directors are not liable if the shareholders vote down the pay package. They don't have to make adjustments to the pay package, although many of them do if there's a negative shareholder vote. But the idea is that this will give shareholders greater oversight, in particular because shareholders increasingly are being called to task. Sharehold, uh, uh, managers are increasingly being called to task by shareholders. Shareholder voting is getting increasingly important. Uh, this is a way of trying to harness that power. Right? Um, and as I said, it's part of a shareholder empowerment movement more generally. What is the rationale? Why should we make executive pay practices something that's subject to a shareholder vote? If you go back, and I actually looked at this issue some 20 years ago, if you go back long enough, we all said, you know, how much you pay executives, how you structure their pay, that's kind of a typical management decision maybe a typical board decision. It's not for the shareholders, right? This is operational, this is not big picture. The SEC, back in the 1990s, granted all these no action requests for shareholder proposals that wanted to talk about executive pay, said no, no, that's not on the table. That's not for shareholders to talk about. The SEC obviously changed its view in part because of some of the arguments in favor of shareholder empowerment. Why is shareholder empowerment good or better? Well, its defenders say one thing about shareholder empowerment is you don't have the risk of regulatory error. If the government mandates a particular pay structure, a particular pay level, and we tried that too, right? We limited the deductibility of executive compensation. If it wasn't performance-based, that led to stock options, that led to an escalation in overall pay levels, right? So we can get it wrong in any number of ways. But if we do it through private ordering, if we do it through individual shareholders, we're gonna reduce the risk that regulators will get it wrong. That's a good thing. Second, um, it may not be the case that the pay structure should be identical at every big company or every public company. So if we leave it up to the shareholders, maybe the shareholders, they, they after all understand the company, they analyze the company, make, maybe their analysis can be more fine tuned. Um, and finally, we take things like politics out of the picture, right? These are, at the end of the day, even though I've been calling them public companies, right? These are private, uh, property. These are companies that are making money for shareholders. Let's give the shareholders a choice about how to do all of this. Um, and some recent commentators have also said, you know, in a way, shareholder democracy is great because it's almost a substitute for the political process without all the politics. After all, these days, you've got a lot of different people represented among those shareholders. You've got hedge funds on the one hand, you've got public pension funds and labor funds with their agenda, you've got retail investors. So you sort of incorporate all these different perspectives, all of these different voices into the mix. Maybe that's a good thing. Um, finally, to the extent we've got all of these different shareholder groups, maybe when shareholders are empowered, they're overseeing a corporation. They're not just acting as shareholders, but they're agents for society more generally. Maybe they address this public view of the corporation, and they don't act entirely out of selfish or pure investor motives. 
It's an optimistic story, but it's certainly a possibility. Well, those are reasonable arguments, but I think our experience with say on pay and our experience with shareholder empowerment suggests we should take those arguments with a grain of salt. There are limits on what shareholders can do. What are some of those limits? Well, first of all, and focusing here on executive compensation, shareholders have limited capacity. You know, it's hard to figure out the right way to pay executives. Academics have been writing articles, not just law, legal academics, business school academics and finance professors have been writing articles for years. How should we pay executives? Should we give them stock? Should we give them stock options? Should we give them stock that doesn't vest for a number of years? Should we make them hold the stock for 10 years after they leave the company so that they've got a long-term perspective, so that they put a, a good succession plan into place, right? All of those possibilities. But um, very difficult to identify the right structure, the incentives that you want to create, it's complicated. Executive compensation has a lot of moving parts, right? I've been talking about salary and stock options, but there's benefits, there's different kinds of uh, bonuses. What performance do you tie performance-based compensation to? A whole literature says, well, you know, most of a corporation's performance is actually based on the overall economy. When, you know, when the economy does well, most businesses do well. So performance-based compensation essentially rewards executives in large part for being lucky. Hard to separate that out, hard to really focus on firm-specific performance. And for many years, the tax law and accounting rules made it even harder because they penalized companies that tried to be more focused in their approach. But anyway, this stuff is hard to understand, and shareholders, by and large, are not compensation. Um, uh, uh, experts. When you get to the question of the vote on, say, on pay, think also about the capacity, the bandwidth of these investors who are going to cast their votes. Right? BlackRock, one of the biggest institutional investors, voted shares in almost 15,000 shareholder meetings worldwide. They've got a staff, they've got a bigger governance staff than most institutional investors. I think they've got about 20 people that sit down and read the proxy statements, that review the compensation plans. 20 people evaluating, even if you just limited it to the almost 4,000 companies in the United States. How much time and attention can they devote? And remember, it, they're not just voting on executive compensation. They're evaluating the directors. They're evaluating proxy contests and merger votes and everything else. So it's hard. As a result of the difficulty, the information overload, the limited capacity, institutional investors rely very heavily on proxy advisors. And that's its own issue, right? The influence of proxy advisors, what some people call insidious influence, has gotten a lot of public attention. The SEC last year reduced this, released this new guidance, this white paper, saying really institutional investors have an obligation not to rely so heavily, an obligation to do their own research. Again, right, look back at those numbers. How much independent research are the institutions going to do? And think about it from the perspective, not just of a BlackRock, but say a Vanguard. Vanguard's our local mutual fund company, you know, they're right up in Malvern, so, you know, I see the Vanguard folks all the time. Vanguard's a really big mutual fund company. The vast majority of Vanguard's money is indexed, passively managed, right? So they're not competing for your money uh, based on their stock picking skills. Basically, what they promise you is a market rate of return. What they compete on is cost low fees. Well, if you want Vanguard to analyze governance issues, to vote the stock that they hold intelligently, they have to hire people. They have to do research. That increases costs. That increases fees. Those increases are in tension with Vanguard's basic business model. How much reasonably can we expect institutional investors to do? It's no surprise if they rely on intermediaries, right? Even if 
shareholders can do this, even if they act intelligently and they do a good job. What are their incentives? As an investor, your primary objective is to make money. When you look at something like executive compensation, what do you want the compensation plan to incentivize the managers to do? You want it to incentivize the managers to make money. And in order to make money, basic corporate finance tells us you need to take risks. Right? What happened at the chief investment office of JP Morgan? They made a lot of money because they had compensation plans that incentivized them to take a lot of risk. Is that in tension with shareholder objectives? No, I think it's dead on. I think it's exactly what shareholders would have wanted the office to do, the incentive structure to look like. Right? And we see this reflected in the shareholder voting on executive compensation and on Jamie Dimon himself. I'll show you a couple of charts very quickly in a minute. Right? But shareholders at J.P. Morgan were generally happy with the way the executives were being paid. Warren Buffett, right? and I like Warren Buffett. I don't think, you know, in terms of well-motivated investors, you know, I'll put all of my money with Warren Buffett. Um, Warren Buffett said, if I own J.P. Morgan, he'd be running it and he'd be making more money than the directors are paying him. Right? This is a shareholder perspective. Jamie Dimon would be making even more money. Okay, so very quickly, I said I was focusing on J.P. Morgan, but I wasn't suggesting that J.P. Morgan was exceptional. It's not, right? We've seen a few years of experience with, say, on pay. What we see is shareholders generally approve executive compensation packages. The rate of approval is extremely high. And issuers have mostly adjusted to the process, making the approval rates even higher. 2% right? a year kind of overstates things. In the first few years, issuer did some, issuers did some things that shareholders didn't like. Shareholders said they didn't like it. Issuers fixed it. So generally, approval rates have gotten higher. Um, the issuer response, not clear that it's beneficial. There are a few studies. What are companies doing in response to more active shareholder supervision? They are making changes. Those changes, one, don't seem to re be reducing overall levels of executive compensation. And number two, don't seem to be improving corporate performance. Now, again, looking at executive pay, it's a little bit challenging. What's our benchmark? Maybe they're reducing pay disparities or something like that. I don't know. We don't yet have the SEC's final pay disparity rule, but I don't think so. All right. So that's what's going on with uh, Jamie Dimon, right? If you look at 2012, you see that's the year when, at the end of the year, the board of directors cut back on his pay after the news of the whale. But by and large, right, his pay reflects what I said earlier, the overall performance of the general economy, not the whale, not the subsequent scandals, right? Um, even though he guided the company through the financial crisis fairly well by all accounts, that's when he took the pay hit. The pay hit wasn't tied to the various examples of problematic conduct that I identified earlier, right? Say on pay, again, fairly uh, consistent, high levels of shareholder support, including all through the whale and the post-whale period and the time when J.P. Morgan kept, it seemed like every month, releasing a statement, oh, we had to pay regulators another few billion dollars, which of course comes out of stockholders' pockets. Right? One thing that I want to note, right? I mentioned the pay cut in 2012. The Morgan um, executive contracts also had a provision, not a very common provision at that time, pre-whale, that gave the bank the authority to claw back compensation from its executives. And they used that provision to take back most of that money 
from the executives in the chief investment office after the whale. Clawbacks haven't gotten a lot of positive support as a so-called governance reform. Dodd-Frank includes a provision requiring clawbacks, but it hasn't been fully implemented. And the issuer community, the corporate community, has responded very negatively to clawbacks. The idea that you would take away an executive's pay in a situation in which you can't prove that that executive engaged in affirmative wrongdoing, right, failing to detect or failing to supervise, that's not in the issuer community an adequate justification for clawbacks. But clawbacks, I think, are a, an illustration of an approach that really hasn't gotten a lot of public support and shareholder support. And some of the reason for that may be the limitations of shareholder empowerment that I was talking about earlier. This is a complex issue, right? This isn't what might be the darling of the institutional community or ISS. So I've given you sort of summary statistics, but I think if you look at the overall story of say on pay, and it's a work in progress, Shareholder empowerment doesn't seem like a tool that's well suited to addressing the problems at JP Morgan. Is there an alternative? Well, I hasten as a sort of free market person to support a regulatory alternative. But think for just a minute about the Volcker Rule. Now, the Volcker Rule, highly controversial part of Dodd-Frank, Main purpose of the Volcker Rule is to get banks out of the business of engaging in proprietary trading. And yes, if JP Morgan had not been allowed to engage in proprietary trading, presumably it couldn't have done all the risky derivatives trading that led to the whale. Except that there are exceptions in the Volcker Rule. Exceptions for market making, exceptions for certain kinds of investment banking activity, stabilization, uh, and exceptions for hedging. Remember the activities in the CIO? That was the hedge that wasn't. As initially drafted, the Volcker Rule would seemingly have permitted J.P. Morgan to do exactly what it did so long as that trading office was billed as a hedge. Okay. And of course, Jamie Dimon, on record, Volcker rule is bad policy and of mind-numbing complexity. After news of the whale became public, regulators were still working on the Volcker rule, and they made a few last-minute changes. And two changes that I think are perfectly tied to the problems evidenced by the whale. One, if you're going to fall or try to fall within an exception as a permitted trading practice, the final Volcker, Volcker rule says you've got to document that. The London office would have had to show not only that they were engaged in hedging, but how the particular trading strategy that the whale was engaged in was designed to reduce the bank's risk. I've suggested, based on the congressional investigation, that it wasn't a hedging strategy and that they wouldn't have been able to put together that documentation. Second, if you're engaged in one of these trading activities that's not proprietary trading, the bank has to design your compensation so that you don't have trading type incentives, right? The incentives for making money, for taking on risk that were present at the whale, those are prohibited under the Volcker Rule. Now, I'm not saying that the Volcker Rule and banning proprietary trading is the solution to the financial crisis. Don't get me wrong. And I'm not saying that the approach that is taken here extends to more general issues with respect to executive compensation. But the Volcker Rule was adopted after some experience with shareholder empowerment responding to the financial crisis, responding to the problems at J.P. Morgan, and to what appeared to be a failure of shareholder empowerment. 
sometimes one size is better than simply relying on the shareholders. So let me conclude, because I promised you I would. All right, limited case study, illustrating the role of incentives on risk taking and some of the limitations of shareholder oversight. Right? Shareholder empowerment is great. We can think of a dozen areas that I haven't mentioned in which it might be far better than regulation, but it's not a complete substitute. It's not a complete solution. Right? And in particular, shareholder power is an especially bad tool for addressing the problem, one of the big contributing factors to the financial crisis, managerial risk taking. All right, and I'm done. You can have at me. In the back. My next textbook is on the role of the corporate compliance officer in relationship to external and internal forces within the corporation. I'm curious about your view on how to incentivize the individual when he or she takes on the role of corporate compliance officer, what form of pay or compensation could optimally incentivize them? That's a great question, and since you're writing a book, you're going to do all of that work that I could just piggyback on. But you're absolutely right, and it's a hugely neglected area, right? All of this time that we've been focused on executive compensation, it's about things like motivating uh, executives to increase corporate performance, measuring executive performance in terms of stock price or profitability or return on assets. And there are a whole bunch of executives that we're only starting to pay attention to, and the head of compliance is one of them, that we have no idea how to compensate. We have no idea even what the right metric is for determining whether they're doing a good job. Now, with respect to hedging, I think it's a little easier, right? I think we have established metrics that could have allowed JP Morgan to compensate those executives based on mitigating risk. Compliance, much harder. And historically, compliance officers have not been highly valued in the corporation, in large part because their good job doesn't fit within those traditional metrics. Um, but it's a great question, and I, you know, I, I applaud the effort. Preferences, I realize what I'm asking would, would flout all sorts of obligations of the individuals involved in the customary setting, but have there been any serious proposals that large companies with this kind of public impact be required to have officially designated public representatives on the board of directors? Uh, I haven't seen anything. Um, there are other areas in which public representatives on the board, like you know, stock exchanges and things like that, where you see that movement. And I'm, uh, I guess, not particularly expert in how those efforts have worked out or how they're even evaluated. But my impression is, and this is, you know, this goes into sort of a broader uh, issue about how exactly do you structure the board of directors, another very interesting topic. Um, one way to try and get at these issues and get at corporate publicness is through public representation on the board, but then you um, risk uh, sort of running afoul of all of these other issues, cohesive board, board dynamic, um, expertise, um, uh, credibility, you know, every time, and you know, we see this movement going on in some other countries, less in the United States, and every time you get into this issue of uh, representative directors, directors who are supposed to play a certain role, that both brings their insights to the board, but also limits their effectiveness with respect to the overall operation of the company. So it's a hard question, and I don't have a good answer for you. Right, so that's a great question, and one of the ongoing challenges in business is that it's always easy to distinguish a good risk from a bad risk with hindsight, you know? 
the good risk is the one that paid off. The bad risk is the one where you got burned. And of course, that's not a very practical approach. And that's why we have things like the business judgment rule to protect people from liability for taking what turned out after the fact to be bad risks. But I think where we see business moving, and I think law is recognizing this fact, it's not so much about trying to limit risk. It's to understand and to manage risk, right? A calculated risk that turns out to be wrong. Um, you know, the corporation can be hurt, but that's not necessarily from a societal perspective problematic. The risk that people didn't adequately um, analyze, understand, calculate, or the risk that they ignored, or the risk that they covered up, that's something different. And so we're looking a lot at putting uh, people on boards who can deal with risk management, who have enough expertise to understand the business issues, and we're looking for corporations to develop risk management systems. And that's why I said, you know, one of the problems at J.P. Morgan isn't just that the whale made a bunch of risky bets. It's that they had these risk managements in place that were designed to keep things from getting as bad as they did. The warning bells went off, and the risk management policies didn't operate as an effective check. Right? So that's not a problem of misjudging risk. It's a failure to respond. And that's where I think there's a lot of room for improvement. playing a role uh, in executive compensation for other purposes besides risk uh, managing risk within a corporation? Right, so that's a good question, and it's a question that I've thought about a lot. I mean, the publicness debate is kind of torn between are we trying to make corporations better run as corporations, right, more profitable, more efficient, and so forth, or are we trying to make corporations more socially responsible, more responsive to societal interests, reducing you know, wealth and income disparities and that kind of thing. And it's true that when we talk about the role of shareholder empowerment, it might be different depending on what our objectives are. Um, and I guess the challenge with shareholder empowerment, even with respect to those broader public objectives, is again, look at the shareholders, look at the shareholders' incentives, look at who the shareholders are, and you know, can we, um, with all of the limit structural limitations in the process, can we really look at that as a, a reliable way of translating public objectives into corporate decision making? It's similar to the public director. Right? It's, it's challenging because many of those things that are sort of on the corporate socially responsible agenda are there because in the political arena, we can't really achieve consensus. We're not sure what the right thing is to do. We're not sure exactly how to deal with pay and uh, wealth disparities. We're not sure how to deal with outsourcing products and our obligations with respect to uh, manufacturing processes and labor processes abroad. We're not uh, sure how much uh, initiative corporations should take for minimizing their environmental footprint. And since we can't ro resolve those policy issues, we say, okay, well, let's leave it up, and corporations should just sort of sort this out through some sort of internalized um, uh, view of their public presence. And that's, uh, you know, to a little bit, that's maybe passing the buck. Other questions? Well, thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you so very much.